and welcome to the Book Club Review, the podcast about book clubs and the books that get people talking. For many readers, Ella Bertude will need no introduction. Bibliotherapist and author with Susan Elderkin of classic books about books, The Novel Cure and The Story Cure, her most recent work is The Art of Mindful Reading, a practical guide that promises to help people to read more mindfully, bringing their lives to books and books into their lives equally. Ella has spent her career refining the art of the book recommendation, and I was thrilled to get the chance to ask her for some tips on how to tackle my toppling pile of books to read. She also has great advice on everything from how to keep a successful book journal to what to do when you're not enjoying your book club book. But to begin at the beginning, I got Ella to read for me the story she includes in The Art of Mindful Reading of when she first learned to read. When I was five years old, my parents took me and my brother on a journey from Iran to Finland, driving in a Wolseley 1300. In those days, we had no seatbelts, and I lay on the parcel shelf with a stack of picture books. I decided I was going to learn to read, and I copied out the letters on each page, proudly showing them to my parents at the end of each day. I got through Ferdinand as we drove through Turkey, the cat in the hat as we traversed Hungary, and Struel Peter as we sped through Germany. My brother Chris could already read and he helped me to master the alphabet. By the time we reached Helsinki, I was firmly addicted to the magic of the page. Nothing could tear me away from a book, be it the cotton fields of Isfahan or the metre-thick ice of Helsinki Harbour. At first, delighted that I'd been kept so well distracted during this three-week journey, undeterred through an avalanche and a heat wave. My parents soon began to wonder, was I going to miss out on life through reading too much? I love that story. What an epic story of learning to read. It's just fantastic. And you go on to talk about your mother and how she was your first example of mindful reading in a way, because she had this magical ability to immerse herself in a book with all the chaos of family life going on around her. And apparently she was able to just sit there and be very absorbed in what she was doing. And I felt really quite relieved when I read that because I've been known to dive into a book to escape from my children. (laughs) And I always feel you know, a bit bad about that. But I was delighted to see that actually what I'm modelling is this amazing thing, which is to be absorbed in a book. Absolutely. I think the fact that she was like a still centre in the whirlwind or hurricane that we were all enacting around her was really inspiring. And I think many people with children do find it difficult to squeeze reading into a busy family life. Did you manage to find a way to do it yourself? My default method has been to listen to audiobooks. While having children, I listen to audiobooks in the middle of the night while breastfeeding at two or three in the morning. And then having the baby in a pouch, I was listening to audiobooks, going around the house and garden, sorting things out. And As they've grown up, I've carried on listening to audiobooks while doing tedious household chores. So I do try not to listen to audiobooks while having a conversation with my children, because that's obviously going a bit too far. (laughs) But all the moments in between when I'm driving them to and from places or when I don't need to actually give them my attention. The minute I can grab an audiobook, I do. And I think that's a really great way of coping with the fact that you don't really have time to sit down and read. But then another great method that I do always recommend to people as a bibliotherapist is to try and have a moment during the weekend, which I would call Victorian reading hour, when I suggest that people declare that they're going to now turn off the Wi-Fi, all sit down and read together. So a family, whether it's two people or a couple with kids or whatever configuration of family you have, then just say, right, now is the time we're all going to read. And it could just be half an hour or it could be up to an hour if you can last that long. So you all grab your own book, sit down together and enjoy reading together without any distraction. And although people might initially not be that keen, particularly if they're little, if they're toddlers, you can gradually get them used to the idea, do it every week, and it will become part of your ritual. That does mean that every week people are used to that idea of now's the time that we're all going to sit and read together. And it can be a great way of forging out time for you as a parent to read. Because that's the other thing is whenever you're 
kids are actually sitting still for once, you think, great, now's the time that I can get on with that pile of washing up I need to do. But you actually have to say to yourself, I'm going to read as well. And for you to value that time and make it work for you too. That is the challenge, isn't it? Yeah. So you started reading early and then you went on to study English at Cambridge and then came the School of Life and Bibliotherapy. Can you tell people what that is? Susan Elderkin and I, when we were at Cambridge together, we'd started talking about the idea of bibliotherapy and taking it somewhere. And we had initially thought maybe we'll try and be like book doctors and have an agony aunt column for a newspaper or similar. But we never quite got that together. Susan wrote her novels. I did my painting. And then one day we bumped into Alain de Botton when he was starting off the School of Life. And we'd had this bibliotherapy concept brewing. And we got chatting to him and said, what do you think? Should we try and do bibliotherapy at the School of Life? Because he was just getting it going. And we worked out over a period of months, how to do it. We slowly evolved the idea of sending out a questionnaire to the clients. They fill in the questionnaire. Then we meet for a one-hour session and we talk through the clients' issues in reading. Why do they read? What do they read? Where do they read? How do they read? What books have they loved? What books have they hated? And what's going on in their life currently Are they single, married, divorced? Do they have any particular issues? Do they have kids? Where do they want to be in 10 years' time? Are they in the middle of a career change? Do they have any relationship difficulties? All those questions. And we then think about the prescription, which is another stage in the process. And we send the client a prescription after the event, which is written down. And it's six books with the reasons for why we're prescribing those books. So the whole process is a highly tailored individual process. And it took us about a year to evolve how to make that work. We started off at the School of Life in 2008, and we've been going ever since very happily. And how we describe the School of Life, I always think it's a bit like a sort of nice idea about helping people lead wiser lives through philosophy and bringing that to bear on all different aspects of our lives. How do you explain that to people? Yeah, I mean, I would say you've got it in a nutshell. It's almost like continuing your education beyond A-level or university. It's for anyone that wants to continue to think about the meaning of life where they're going, why, and issues about how to cope with death, how to cope with relationships, what is going to be a meaningful career for you. So they do lots of different courses which you can join and they also do one-off sessions so you can have a career MOT when you ponder what career you really want to do, that kind of thing. Or there's obviously the bibliotherapy. They also do psychotherapy, but they're always doing really brilliant different courses, which are all about discovering deeper meaning, really. Bibliotherapy is so interesting. It might be, say, someone who reads a lot, but they feel like they're stuck in a rut. And so it's giving them new suggestions, or it might be someone who doesn't read that much. And so suddenly it's like ideas for things that they might like to try that will take them on a reading journey. But one of the things I think is really interesting is, on one hand, the sort of novelty idea of it in a way, having someone come in and find out about your reading life and suggesting things to read. But the other aspect of it is the sort of genuine interest you have in the therapeutic side. You know, how can reading heal us? How can we learn from the books that we read? We do have very different ranges of clients from the ones that just want a kind of reading makeover to the ones who actually are going through a genuine crisis in their lives. And it's part of our job whenever we meet a new client to discover how much therapy they need. So whether they're just after a kind of reading makeover or whether they really want a more in-depth process of bibliotherapy per se. And that's part of the art is discovering that and then trying to apply the right books to them at this time. And that's a complex scenario because you've got to find out what kind of books they love, what kind of books they're going to respond well to, because some people are going to love literary fiction, other people 
might much prefer to read science fiction or something much more light. But whatever it is, we need to give them a book that's going to speak to them on a subconscious level. So if we discover as a bibliotherapist that their issue might be bereavement or loss, I then need to think, okay, should I give you a book that really looks deeply into your sense of loss and reflects it back at you? Or would you rather actually have a very escapist book so that you're just managing to cope and not dwelling on your sense of sadness and desolation? It's always incredibly personalised. And the reason that we do prescribe fiction is that we feel that fiction speaks to you on a subconscious level. So when you read a novel, you become the characters that you're reading and you effectively enter into their psyche and take on their characteristics and being. And you have a sense of catharsis because of that, because you go through the feelings and emotions that they're going through. And that changes you on a very deep level. I was wondering if there was a book that you could think of that was a book where you'd had that experience yourself, where you maybe needed something from a book and then you found the right book. Um, A book that really helped me when I was grieving the loss of my mother was What I Loved by Siri Hustvet, which came to me almost by accident because it was highly recommended to me as a book about the art world. And when I was reading it, in terms of thinking about it for art, I actually didn't really enjoy it. Initially, I found it highly intellectual and a bit off-putting. But after my mother died, I picked up the book again, and it has an incredibly devastating loss of one of the characters. And I totally related to the loss of that person because of the loss of my mother. And it was incredibly helpful and cathartic because it was so profoundly felt and so deeply analysed, a bit like Joan Didion's book, The Year of Magical Thinking, which is another book which analyses grief in a very fundamental and deep way. And I also found that book profoundly helpful too. So both of those books are books that I've recommended to people in that situation. And so you've been doing bibliotherapy for a while at the School of Life, and then you decided to package it all up into The Novel Cure, which I can't imagine anyone not knowing about The Novel Cure because it's such a kind of touchstone book for me, because it sort of has all that in there. It has all of these book recommendations, but for every possible mood or thing that you might be experiencing, whether even it's just boredom or some quite trivial things, just to sort of really profound things. Tell us a little bit more about that. What led to the idea for producing it? Well, Susan and I had been working as bibliotherapists at the School of Life for five years. And we'd had a lot of experience of meeting different clients and prescribing them different books. And we started thinking, wouldn't it be great and really helpful to have a manual of bibliotherapy? So that was the idea, how it began. And we were thinking it would be great to have a selection of ailments and a selection of cures and put them together. We then spent a lovely weekend together down in Somerset, where Susan lived at the time, with a bottle of wine, thinking about ailments and cures, thinking of all the books that we loved most and which had been most brilliant for prescribing people, and all the issues that people most commonly came to us with. Initially, I think we had about 500 ailments and we had to madly cut them down because we wanted to have a combination of serious ailments such as bereavement, loss, depression, suicidal thoughts, shyness. But then we also wanted to have more humorous ailments, some of which have remained in the book, such as hiccups or as well as broken heart. We've got broken leg and broken china. We wanted to have some that were a bit frivolous, but we also, of course, wanted to have all the more serious and genuine ailments that people come to us with on a daily basis. It took a lot of research. We pulled in lots of our friends and asked them. So the whole thing took about two years to get down into writing. And at the time, Susan was living in America. I was living here in England. So we had a time difference to deal with. 
we both had small children. So it was pretty hectic getting it all together and finding ways of being able to communicate. But we wrote it mostly on Google Docs so we could edit each other's writing on a daily basis. And that was how we managed to do it. And it was really good fun. It is the most incredible achievement. And I love the way I keep it quite handy because quite often I just idly will pick it up because I always know wherever I open it, I'm going to read something of interest. And I love the way that sometimes you articulate things that maybe I didn't even know I had a word for, but they're there. So I've just opened it at random just now. And there's a page reading ailment, finishing fear of, and then you've got your (laughs) suggestion. You've been delighted by the book, befriended the characters in the book, wolfed down the book, dreamt about the book, missed the book, cried with the book, made love to the book, thrown the book across the room, been dead to the world outside the book, and now you're about to finish the book. We've all been there. It's a terrible, gutting moment. And I thought, yes, I know that feeling. But then you have some very good suggestions for what you can do. You can read around the book. You can read an interview with the author, you know, just helpful tips. And we talked, didn't we, about not having a word for that feeling of terror and dread when you finish a book just before you go to sleep. So people who read just before they go to bed, which is for me, it's my primary reading time is end of the day before I go to sleep. And generally speaking, I'll read a bit and then I fall asleep and, you know, I still have plenty more of the book to go. But every once in a while, I will finish the book just before going to sleep. And there's feels like kind of an abyss to me then. And we don't have a name for that one, do we? No, that's true. And we need a name for it. I think we should come up with one. (laughs) We should put it out to the world. Um, But I think the only answer is to have another book to hand, frankly, whether it's another book by the same author or a book that you've pre-prepared. Or actually, I do think having a collection of short stories by your bedside is a really good thing because then you can always be reassured by the fact that there's something else to come to soon. But the other thing I'd mention actually for that moment of doom is that you should definitely have your reading notebook to hand, which is something that I recommend to everyone is to keep a reading notebook. And the time to pick up your reading notebook is in that moment of mourning the loss of the book that you've just finished, because then it will all be fresh in your mind. It gives you a chance to carry on talking to the book in a way by putting it down in your reading notebook. And it cements your feelings of how you felt just at that moment of finishing the book. So it's really good to try and pick it up on the day that you finish the book, possibly even in the moment that you finish the book, and devote one page to writing the book. And if it is pre-falling asleep... You can just do it in a kind of semi-conscious way, but there's nothing like having that precious memory encapsulated in your reading notebook. And these are the kind of things that we're getting to in your latest book, The Art of Mindful Reading. For me, the idea of reading is quite an active thing. I feel like almost I'm quite busy when I'm reading in a lovely way, you know, in a kind of delightful way. But so the idea of mindfulness, which to me, I think is sort of being very still, kind of meditating. It wasn't an obvious candidate for something that I thought I could do mindfully. But in your book, you explain ways of how we can bring the idea of mindfulness to reading. Yes. Well, it is a contradictory idea. Mindfulness is all about living in the moment and being fully aware of everything around you. And when you're reading a book, you're doing the opposite of that. You are losing yourself in the book. But I think there's various different aspects of mindfulness and reading. So one of the key things is what we were talking about earlier with my mum being able to be completely lost in the book. That sense of mindfulness is that you are actually absolutely mindful of everything about the book, all aspects of the characters that you're reading. And you're basically living in that world. You've gone into another world, which is your sort of ideal as a child that lots of people have of living in that universe and being completely lost in it. But then there's also other ways of applying mindfulness to reading, such as being completely aware of all the visual repercussions of every word in the book. So reading a passage like from Tess of the D'Urbervilles and thinking of every single idea that comes to mind visually from the passages described, because 
Thomas Hardy is such a richly visual writer that you can really fly off thinking about every image that he's describing to do with cold frosty air, the snow coming in under a door, the little cones of snowflakes. It's just amazing to allow your mind to go into all those nooks and crannies of imagination. And I think that's an aspect of mindfulness and reading, which is, it's a kind of meditation on the text, which I think is really rich and resonant. Then there's also other aspects of mindfulness and reading, such as questioning what kind of reader you are, whether you're a visual reader, an auditory kind of reader, or a kinesthetic kind of reader. And there's exercises in the book to try and help you discover that. And once you have worked that out, you can apply what you've realised to your experience of reading. So if you realise that you're an auditory kind of reader, for instance, you can practice much more auditory types of reading. So reading aloud with a friend or partner, listening to audiobooks, and so on. If you realise that you're a kinesthetic kind of reader, then you might apply that knowledge to the idea of doing something while reading. Because if you're a kinesthetic kind of reader, it means that you want to enter literally into the world of the book almost physically. And you might be the kind of person that finds it difficult to just sit still and read as well. So there are a couple of ways of uh, approaching that. One is to try and literally act out the scenes of the book. So if you're reading a Thomas Hardy Test for the D'Urbervilles type book, you might go into a field and start doing some incredibly tedious and pointless activity like Tess has to do. Some reaping. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Get your fingers into the earth and live out the life of the characters. But then another way of approaching being a kinesthetic kind of reader is to do something while reading, such as hula hooping while reading, which is something that I've demonstrated occasionally. Because if you're doing something physically while reading then it kind of allows your mind to focus more on the book, paradoxically. A bit like having a fidget spinner, if you're the kind of person that needs to always be doing something. It does help you to be doing something physically. So some people can actually walk while reading, or hula hoop while reading, or climb a tree and then sit in a tree while reading. So that, in a way, your body is occupied by doing something which allows your brain to fully enter the world of the book. Yes, I love that idea of climbing a tree because one of the things about mindfulness is almost jolting us slightly out of our habits. Yes. So if we do something where, say, for example, you might sit in a different chair from the one that you normally do when you sit down to eat dinner. I loved applying this to reading and thinking, you know, I always read last thing at night in bed. Maybe, you know, maybe not at that time of night, but (laughs) I did quite like the idea of going down to the park and at least maybe finding a bench or somewhere that I wouldn't normally sit to read. Because then what happens is it does sort of sharpen your concentration, doesn't it? You're suddenly very aware of what you're doing and the thing you're experiencing. I love the way this book is so full of practical tips, things like how to make your own perfect book nook. I can see behind you, you've got this amazing sort of hanging pod. Is that where you like to curl up and read? Yes, that's my reading chair, which I'm deeply in love with. And I only got it fairly recently, but it's the perfect place to read, I think, because you're hanging suspended in your own little cocoon. I sometimes even put a blanket around it as well, so I'm just completely hidden in there. I really recommend to people to have some kind of book nook to create their own. It can be as simple as just having a nice cushion that is your reading cushion that you take and put in different places around your house to read. Or even a swing in the park that you like to go and sit in and that's your special reading spot. Because I think if you do have a particular reading spot that you like to go to, it signals to your brain whenever you go there you're going to now read. And so you're more likely to be able to get lost in your reading and continue reading uninterrupted, particularly if you've turned off your Wi-Fi as well and told people that's what you're doing so they're not going to interrupt you. 
one of the practical suggestions you have is recommending that people make some kind of journal or notebook and jot down some thoughts about their reading as they go along. I'm someone who finds that really hard because I'm always so busy just reading the thing. I don't want to interrupt myself to kind of pull out a quote or whatever, which is silly because then I guess I lose that experience of having things to turn back to because, of course, you forget and move on to the next thing. What are your tips for journaling and how do you keep track of everything you read? It is difficult because I know what you mean. When you're in the flow of the book, you don't want to interrupt yourself. I tend to wait until I've finished the book before I write about it. But my main tip is to do it immediately you finish the book, if possible, to try and sit down straight after finishing it, or at least on that day. Grab your reading notebook. And I think that there's a few things that help you to remember. So obviously, you write down the title, author date you finished reading it, place you were when you read it. So at the moment, we're all stuck at home generally. But in the normal course of life, when you're reading, you might read on a train, on a beach in Spain, visiting your parents in the countryside, or in your own back garden. And actually jotting down where you were when you read the book really helps you remember what was happening in your life. It helps you to visualise the scene of reading the book. So if you read A Gentleman in Moscow while you're on a train to Glasgow, you'll remember that moment and it will help you to remember not just what was happening in the book, but also what was happening in your life. For me, that's one of the most helpful things about a reading notebook is looking back and thinking, oh yes, I read Ulysses in my gap year on a beach in Trinidad and I totally picture myself there and I actually remember reading particular scenes and it really helps me visualise the memories of the book. The other helpful memory aids are to think about particular resonances with your own life. So were there any characters in the book that really reminded you of key people in your life, siblings, parents, friends, people you've met? and to jot down those ideas. In a way, relating it back to your own life really helps you to remember aspects of the book that you might not just remember per se. And in your reading life, how do you choose your next read? It's very much led by necessity. Being a bibliotherapist, I need to read everything I possibly can to keep abreast of current releases. So I'm always following the latest prizes, you know, the Women's Prize, the Costa Prize, the Man Booker Prize. Also listening to podcasts such as A Good Read on Radio 4, which are great because they bring up books that you wouldn't necessarily pick up because they're not going to be the latest books. They're people's favourite books that might be from 20 years ago. I find that really inspiring. And also reading reviews in the newspapers, etc. And because I see bibliotherapy clients every day, I frequently get recommended books by them. So it's a two way process. So often I meet a client who says, you know, my favourite book ever in the world is X. And if it's one I haven't heard of, then I immediately think I must read that now. How do you avoid feeling overwhelmed by the sheer amount of stuff that's out there? I'm on Instagram quite a lot. And I'm on Bookstagram, which is the corner of Instagram where people post about books. So actually, the only people I follow in my feed tend to be people posting about books. So all I see when I look at it is books and I love it. You know, it's fantastic. But I was thinking the other day, it's almost you start to feel slightly inundated just by the sheer volume of things that you think look so great and you really want to read them. Have you got any suggestions for how to kind of deal with that feeling of being slightly overwhelmed sometimes by how much there is to read? Yeah, that is a very difficult question. I think the best answer is to book yourself a bibliotherapy session because then you can be guided as to what books are going to be best for you to read at this time in your life. I agree, it can just be so overwhelming thinking all those books to read. Where am I going to start? It's kind of the art of being discerning, isn't it? And not just being like magpies, every new thing that comes along thinking about, well, what do I really need right now? What am I going to get the most out of? Yes. And I suppose, I mean, you like me, you're always going to be reading books that you are feeling like I've got to read everything I possibly can. And I think in terms of being discerning, you just have to think to yourself, you know, what can I cope with reading in terms of time? And would I rather delve into some enormous tome? 
and actually get lost in that, maybe that's going to be better for me than trying to read like a magpie all these different books which are coming to me constantly. And can you tell us three books that are on your current to be read pile? I've actually just done a session last night about mermaids because I was inspired by the fantastic Monique Roffey's Mermaid of Black Conch, which I loved and I've just read and it got me thinking about mermaids in literature. So I went down a rabbit hole of mermaid literature and immediately ordered lots of mermaid books, which I skimmed through for my YouTube session. And I'm now actually going to read. So one of them is The Pisces by Melissa Broder, which is great. I'm about a third of the way through. Then there's Elijah's Mermaid by Essie Fox. And I've also got on the pile, though I have already read it, The Mermaid and Mrs. Hancock, which I loved, but I want to read again. So I'm I'm a great fan of rereading. So actually on my to be read pile, I quite often have rereading as well which I think is lovely if you can reread it. It's always a bit of a toss up between whether you should reread or just go on to the next thing. Well, it's very interesting if you reread something, actually, if you read it, and then if you go back to it after not too much time, which is something that I found I've had to do for the podcast, where sometimes we've done something and then we're going to record on it. And so I will go back to it. And that's been fascinating because it's amazing when you're not reading a book for plot, because you know what's going to happen you then become alive to a whole other level of what's going on with the individual sentences in a way that's really wonderful and something we maybe don't experience that often because most of the time we read something and then we move on. And if we do reread, it tends to be something where we've got to that nice state where we've kind of forgotten it. We just remember we liked it. And so, you know, that it's really lovely to go back and rediscover it. Yes, absolutely. And also rereading books from your childhood is a lovely thing to do or rereading books from 10 years ago because of that idea that you revisit your younger self who first read that book. So it's a way of time traveling. Have you ever been in a book club yourself? Yes, I actually run one or did run one before COVID has temporarily stopped it in a local old people's home, which is a really lovely octogenarian book club that works in a way that is quite prescriptive in a way. I go in and talk about the book in some depth and then get everyone to give their opinions. I really enjoy it and I'm always really stunned and awed by the knowledge of the octogenarians, many of whom are incredibly well read and have had really amazing lives and bring lots of great things to the book club. Do you have any suggestions for how book clubs can get the most out of the books that they're reading and discussing together? I think it actually does really help if someone is willing to take control of the book club each week and in a way act as an arbitrator. So ideally do some research into the author and their books, introduce them, give a kind of 10, 15 minute general intro and then lead discussions about the book. Because I think often what people complain about in terms of book clubs is that they can be a bit too chaotic and disorderly, although they're obviously great socially, and that's a really important part of it. I do quite often meet people who've given up with their book club because they've ended up not really talking about the book, but talking about other things. So I would say it's really good if each time you meet, a different person from the book club can be in charge and lead a discussion and there's all sorts of resources online for finding good questions about the books and also bringing to bear people's personal experiences is really nice too so at the end of the session when you've already sort of analyzed the book asking people if they've got any personal experiences of the themes in the books is really nice as well. And do you have a suggestion for a book that you think would work really well for a book club? Well, good question. Obviously, The Mermaid of Black Conch is in my mind, and I think that is a brilliant one uh, Mm. for a book club. Also, Miss Benson's Beetle by Rachel Joyce. That's a great book club book too. Do you know that one? I don't, actually. That is Rachel Joyce's newest book, and it's all about a woman in her late 40s in the 1950s, who is a spinster working as a teacher, but she's always been obsessed with this golden beetle, which 
is mythically on the other side of the world beyond the coast of Australia. And one day she jacks in her tedious job and goes forth in search of the golden beetle of New Caledonia. And she is a sort of unlikely heroine. She's actually a bit dislikable at first. And she employs someone as her assistant. And the person she employs is really the last person you'd expect to be her friend. And it's a lovely book because it's all about how they slowly develop a friendship. And do they find the golden beetle? I won't tell you. But it's kind of an adventure and a story of friendship and quite an unusual plot. But I think it's one that is great as a book club book because... There's quite a few discussion topics about sexism, colonialism, and ideas of goals in life, which are very thought provoking. Mm, Some good themes to dig into. Interesting, the idea of touching on adventure. And I think in lockdown, that's something that we've all really needed. But now we're starting to emerge slowly, slowly from lockdown. And it's been such a strange time. And no one's quite sure even what the new normal is going to be. Are there any books that you think might be helpful to people right now in kind of negotiating this strange state we're all in? I do think a great one, which has been a really good read during lockdown, but it's also a good one for coming out of lockdown, is A Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Toes. It's been great during lockdown because it's all about being effectively in quarantine for a poor man who has to stay in a hotel for 30 years. It's joyous because of the way that he deals with his confinement and his ever-decreasing sphere. But he does have friendships within that confinement, as we all do, hopefully, in our own locked-down worlds. It also does have an ending in which new beginnings occur and I won't give away what that is but I think it does show a glimmer of light to people of how to get out of their lockdown world. Another one that comes to mind is Ali Smith's There But For The. It's about a man who goes to a dinner party and never leaves. He actually stays in the house of his hosts for many weeks. And it's very funny and quite ironic. I just love it. I found it really entertaining. It's about why does he do that? What does he do while he's staying in that room? And then what happens at the end? And I think that's a funny, entertaining and great read, which talks about our social anxieties, really, which I'm sure lots of people are having in terms of thinking what happens next. I imagine you have to be, to a certain extent, very open to all the books that you read and quite non-judgmental in a way, because even if it's something that you don't personally like, it may be that you think it will be useful. You know, there's a book for everyone, isn't there? It, It will be the right book for someone. What do you do, though, when you come across a book that you don't like? Generally, I will persevere until I like the book. And I pretty much always end up liking the book because I'm very eclectic and in a way forgiving of all possible narrative sins and genre attributes. I think I almost always will end up loving a book unless it's just really poorly written and not a very good book. So there's going to be some books that you're just not going to get on with because they're just not of the highest quality every now and then. But with Almost everything I read that's been recommended to me or that there's a good reason to read that's on a list for a prize or equivalent, I know that I'm going to eventually come to love it. So I think I just have to kind of grin and bear it for a bit. And there are quite a lot of books that that's happened with that I've not really enjoyed for 50 or 100 pages, but then eventually come to love. And I think. With some books, if I'm really struggling to read it, then I'll try it on audio and that would generally flip over the pain barrier. Or conversely, the other way around, if it's a book I've started on audio and I'm not enjoying, then I'll try and read it. So I think 
changing method of reading does really help sometimes because sometimes it might be you just haven't got into the voice for whatever reason whether it's the way it's written on the page or whether it's the way that someone's narrating it so if you try a different approach that can really help i feel very inspired by this generous spirit of reading i think <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> coming to things at the right time makes a big difference as well doesn't it yeah and during lockdown, you've been doing Instagram live sessions, bibliotherapy, and also I think with Damien Barr's literary salon via his Facebook page. So people have been able to watch you do those. And are you going to continue with those, do you think? I'll definitely continue for the time being because I've loved doing them. So for instance, looking into mermaid literature has been really fun. So every week I do a different theme and each time it's led me to discovering new books I love doing them and will carry on for now. I'm booked to carry on with Damien Barr's Literary Salon Facebook page for the rest of the year. And they're monthly. So I will definitely be doing them. Well, I think it's wonderful that they're there. I think it's wonderful that we have these fantastic books that mean that when we're able to read, we can get the most out of our reading time and really benefit from it in a way that's just fantastic. So thank you. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It was really lovely to talk to you as well. It's great to share lovely ideas about books with an equally passionate reader. That's nearly it for this episode. Books mentioned were What I Love by Siri Hustvet, The Year of Magical Thinking by Joan Didion, Tess of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy, The Mermaid of Black Conch by Monique Roffey, The Pisces by Melissa Broder, Elijah's Mermaid by Essie Fox, The Mermaid and Mrs. Hancock by Imogen Hermes Gower, Miss Benson's Beetle by Rachel Joyce, A Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Taus, and There But For The by Ali Smith. You can keep up with Ella via her website, ellabertu.com, and don't miss her themed sessions on Damien Barr's Literary Salon Facebook page and her Instagram and YouTube channels. And if you're in the need of a literary makeover or have something you want to work through in your life, you can sign up for a bibliotherapy session at the School of Life website, theschooloflife.com forward slash shop forward slash bibliotherapy. Our next episode is a bookshelf show in which we discuss the books we're reading outside of book club. So listen in to hear about fantasy bestseller House of Earth and Blood by Sarah J. Mass, thoughtful nonfiction Don't Touch My Hair by Emma DeBerry, Ursula Le Guin's Annals of the Western Shore trilogy and an Arctic memoir from the 1930s, A Woman in the Polar Night by Christiane Ritter. That episode is out next weekend. Until then, don't miss our most recent book club episode on The Mermaid of Black Conch by Monique Roffey, which proved to be one of our favourite reads of the year so far. Listen in to find out what we loved and what some people in my book club didn't. Don't forget to check out our website, where you can find our archive of shows to browse through and our library of book reviews and articles. We've got a new one on our favourite fantasy reads coming soon. And you can also sign up for our weekly newsletter for reviews and links to bookish things we've been enjoying. That comes out every Sunday and is packed with reading inspiration for the week ahead. The sign-up link is in the show notes, and you can also find it on our website and social media pages. If you'd like to see what we're up to between episodes, follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast on Twitter at bookclubrvwpod or email thebookclubreview at gmail.com. And if you're not already, why not subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what we do, please do take a moment to rate and review the show and help other listeners find us. But for now, that's our show. Thanks for listening and happy reading. <laughs>